Lawyers of Reddit, what was your oh crap moment in court? As a law student we were allowed to make court appearances under the supervision of an assistant district attorney. I was doing arraignments and my Ada said don't talk to the judge unless he asks you a specific question. So the judge and the defense attorney were going back and forth about when the next court date would be. The judge wanted a specific date, let's say 4 stroke 20. The defense attorney was adamant that she couldn't do that date. In my file, I had a calendar with a big X over 4 stroke 20 saying do not schedule. The judge and defense attorney go back and forth for several minutes. The judge wanted 4 stroke 20 and the defense attorney saying no. I was keeping my mouth shut because the judge hadn't asked me directly. Finally, the defense attorney relents and agrees to 4 stroke 20. The judge turns to me and says do the people agree with 4 stroke 20 at which point I say sorry your honor, but we cannot schedule for 4 stroke 20. The judge looked at me for a second and then just ripped into me Mr. Jones 1. You just heard me and the defense go back and forth for several minutes about a date you knew the people can do. Do you like wasting the court's time it went on like that for a few minutes. Him just berating me in front of about 200 people in a court in Brooklyn. Finally after me apologizing profusely and him giving me a withering glare. We moved on and went to the next case. At the next break, the judge said Mr. Jones 1. Please approach the bench. I thought I was really in for it then. I walked up beside the bench. The judge came down to talk to me and said with a big smile don't worry about it. I was just giving you a hard time. Welcome to Brooklyn Criminal Court. Opposing counsel was a nightmare. Everything late. His work was extremely subpar. And so forth. Accused me of lying multiple times when he had dropped the ball. During another hearing in which he did another dumb move. Judge says I'm glad you are the last case on the call, and all of the other attorneys have left the room, so they aren't here to hear me say that you are a terrible attorney. During jury selection, I can't be a juror due to the fact I'm kinda racist. Not a lawyer but I had a big oh crap moment. I was in court for driving while suspended in a county and in front of a judge that were both notorious for putting people who did that in jail. My license wasn't supposed to be suspended. A pencil pusher forgot to press a button or something and it never got unsuspended after the time was up. I had proof of this, but I was still really nervous. The guy who went up to the judge before me walked to the table where we were supposed to stand, sat down, and put his feet up on the table. The judge asked him what he was doing and he gave a flippant answer and basically told the judge to get fricked. This seriously peed the judge off. The judge went off on this guy and the guy gave everything right back to him. Peed him off more and more. The judge ended up jailing him for contempt and had the bailiff cuff the guy and put him in a chair off to the side to await the marshals who would transport him to the jail. My name gets called. The judge is looking at me like I am fresh meat and he is a great white shark. I am already thinking to myself okay, if this judge puts you in jail, run over and beat the crap out of the guy that peed the judge off so badly, he's why you're going to jail. The judge looks down at his paperwork and back at me and says you're Mr. My last name. I said yes sir he said yeah, we were talking about you earlier. I am going to void your arrest and dismiss this case. Your license was supposed to be valid and you shouldn't be here. I let out a huge sigh. The judge asked me if I was okay and I said I had been a bit worried. Especially given the guy that was right before me in line. The judge said don't worry about him, he won't be seeing anything that I sent behind bars for about 90 days. And laughed. That's how a judge is supposed to be. Watching a hearing when the defendant said I mean I did stab her, but it was a gentle stabbing. Reminds me of something I read on here where the person said I hit her with a knife. Stabbing. That's called stabbing. Not a lawyer but shared an oh crap moment with one. I hit something in the road and had a tire blow out while driving home from Meps. Hit a concrete divider and wound up rolling my car. No injuries and no other vehicles involved. Received a reckless driving ticket that the officer told me was just procedure and not to be concerned with. Fast forward a month and I'm in court with my lawyer who plans on pointing out this ticket could prevent my hardship enlistment. He's not expecting it to take more than a minute because the issuing officer and prosecutor are on board. A Q group oh crap moment. I'm fourth on the docket and the judge has just handed out maximum sentences for all three prior defendants. The people are getting 6 to 12 months, having licenses revoked, for little stuff. The prosecutor gets screamed at the instant he opens his mouth. 
police officer is told to shut up while answering a question the judge asked, my lawyer is told he's about to be held in contempt, I'm starting to think I'm gonna get three squares and a cot, just not where I planned on getting them. The judge told me to step forward while shuffling my case paperwork and my lawyer just gave me a look that said, I'm so sorry, case dismissed in the interest of justice and if any more idiots waste his time with nonsense like this again everyone is spending the night in county. Medical malpractice defense lawyer here representing hospitals doctors. This was not my oh crap moment but plaintiff so oh crap moment. For context, usually at trial, both plaintiff and defendant will have an expert physician testify as to their opinion to whether the doctor hospital performed everything correctly. I thoroughly researched plaintiff's expert, who was an obgin, baby delivery, and found out he had been suspended a number of times for his own botched deliveries and giving incorrect medical testimony to help plaintiff's cases. During the actual day of trial, Turns out he was not licensed to practice medicine independently without supervision from another physician and he was one year into his three year suspension. Plaintiff's lawyers had no idea about their own expert's background and they just sat there with a blank look on their face. Needless to say, during cross examination, we destroyed his credibility and won at trial. I was prosecuting a contempt action in family court, something that basically never works and everyone in the room could tell I was winning. The other side was unprepared, out of arrogance, and I was basically ripping this guy to shreds on cross-examination, which his lawyer didn't even think would happen, because he expected the case to be dismissed. At the end of the trial, the judge ruled for me and stated that she found the defendant's testimony to be untrustworthy. I was shocked at winning a contempt trial to begin with, but then this exchange happened. Defendant's attorney, your honor, now that you have found my client's testimony to be untrustworthy, I am requesting a continuance in order to prepare further witnesses. This concept is shocking in and of itself, because to even think you can bring more witnesses after you rest your case is laughable. Judge, you had your shot and you missed. Counsel, defendant's attorney, your honor, there was no way I could have anticipated that you'd find my client's testimony untrustworthy and as such. I didn't have the opportunity to prepare other witnesses in support of his position. Judge, that may be an argument for your carrier, counsel, but it holds no water with me. See you this afternoon for sentencing. For those who didn't pick up on it, the judge basically told the lawyer on the record in front of his client that she expects him to get sued for malpractice because he fricked up so royally. That crap was min blowning on multiple levels. I've had a couple. Best one was when I was a youth prosecutor defense attorney in teen court. The youth defendant was on trial for assault. I asked him what happened and he said, my friends told me I wouldn't beat up the Easter bunny at the mall so I did. Only time I truly could not control my laughter in court. Another, I was watching a detention hearing in federal court. Only issue is whether the defendant will get to go home until trial. This was an appeal of the court's previous decision that the defendant be held until trial. The third witness was an FBI agent which, needless to say, is not normal at a detention hearing. The FBI agent testified that some other attorney, not the one representing the defendant at the hearing, had been taking letters from the defendant and sending them to different people for the defendant. Those letters were contracts to have the prosecuting attorney killed. The representing attorney withdrew and the defendant was not released pending trial. One more. I was in traffic court one time and a sovereign citizen who was acting fairly hostile began approaching the judge's bench. He was arrested at gunpoint which was pretty wild considering there were 150 or so people in the courtroom. Last one. My first ever civil trial I was representing the plaintiff who wanted to evict the defendant from her property for non-payment of rent. After presenting my case, the judge asked the defendant to present his evidence. The defendant replied. The judge said, now is your turn to present your case. The defendant said, I don't understand. The judge leans over the bench and asks, why are you here? The defendant said, oh yeah, yeah, right. The defendant then went on a 30 minute tangent about all sorts of things like how he only parks his car so he can see where he is going when he pulls out because that was taught when he was in the military. I could have objected but the more he talked, the more the judge disliked him. After 30 minutes the judge finally asked, about the rent the defendant says, oh yeah, I'm not trying to debate that I didn't pay it, that's how I won my first civil trial. Not in court but a deposition. 
plaintiff in a sexual harassment case that was suspected to be paid roleplay with her boss, kept a very detailed diary on her work computer. At one point she was asked to read from the diary for the record and asked if she had written the accounts and if they were true. She was asked at several points if she wanted her new husband to leave the room while she did this, but declined. Let's just say it was extremely kinky, she confirmed it was true, and the only mention of her now husband was that he was boring in bed but she was going to marry him because she couldn't get her first, second or third choice. He ended up leaving on his own after she read that part out and confirmed it was him she was writing about. Not a lawyer, but I witnessed my ex-wife try to argue with the judge that she couldn't be accused of kidnapping our daughter because our daughter was legally emancipated. Not a spoiler, she wasn't. At the time of the kidnapping, my ex had legal statutes written on small sheets of paper she had torn out of books in the jail library, and she kept arguing with the judge after being told that none of it mattered. After the fifth time my ex interrupted the judge with her nonsense, the judge slammed her hands down, stood up leaned over her bench and told my ex that she had been a juvenile court judge for 20 years and was well aware of the statutes if she interrupted one more time then she would be held in contempt and spend several months more in jail my lawyer held up his folder in front of his face to hide his grin during this exchange i walked out with full legal and physical custody of my daughter court supervised visitation for my ex and a full restraining order I was interning during law school prosecuting domestic violence cases. The deputy do asked me to talk for the first time during a guy's arraignment for beating his wife. An arraignment is when the defendant hears the charges against them and pleads guilty or not guilty basically. When the judge calls on me to speak, I got insanely nervous and told the defendant that his charge carried a maximum penalty of 30 years when it was actually 30 days. He freaks out. The crowd. Some in the gallery were his family and friends. Gasps. The judge basically stops me and says I think you mean 30 days counselor. After which everyone, including the defendant, laughed at me. I did jury service back in the 90s in the UK. A four day trial where an estate manager, dude in charge of the farms on a big landowner's estate, was on trial for growing and distributing cannabis. The police had raided the greenhouses and surrounding land and found tons of weed in all stages of production. Dude claims that he is addicted to cannabis and because his tolerance is so high after smoking so much for so long that he can only get a buzz from the very tips of the plant, where the THC content is most intense. Asks the court to believe that he just discards the rest of the plant, doesn't sell it, doesn't even give it away, just destroys the rest of the crop. So it's the last day of evidence, where both sides sum up their case and remind the jury of the salient points of what's been said. Dude himself has been quiet and respectful throughout, smart suit, softly spoken, stuck to his answers. I'd say the jury is not buying his claim and as the judge reminds us, it's not about whether we think it should be legalized, it's not about whether we think he has even sold the remaining bits of his plants. All we need to find him guilty is to think that beyond reasonable doubt, he had at some point shared a single joint with a friend, and that that was enough to convict him for supply on the counts against him. So the jury isn't buying his story but we are also looking at him thinking he's quite old, isn't doing anyone any real harm etc, is unlikely to be running a massive dealing empire. Then on that last day, the public gallery, which has been empty all week, is suddenly full of the most blatantly stonery stoners you've seen in your life. One of them is even wearing an Adidas a Dahash t-shirt. The jury files in, we sit down, we look at the public gallery and I think it's safe to say we stare at them. Defense barrister turns to see what we are looking at and visibly slumps, then glowers at the solicitor and hisses really such an own goal. Plot twist. It was the prosecutor who invited them. Two high profile men on trial for killing another guy. Both ex-cops from the 80s, a notorious time in our country for police corruption. The first trial had been aborted after one barrister had made a casual comment that the other accused had already killed two or three people. Second attempt was six weeks into an expected ten week retrial. All of the networks and papers were covering this trial. The gallery was always packed with law students because of the many uniquely horrific aspects of the trial. So, we're six weeks into the retrial. Defense 1 gets up to cross-examine a witness. Did you know of accused murderer 1? Yes, he was a cop and a drug dealer in the 80s. 
the court basically exploded. The judge immediately issued a non-publication order, meaning there was an embargo on all information from that day. It was early afternoon but the judge excused the jury for the day then spent the next day and a half deliberating over whether to abandon the trial. Over halfway through, and for the second time. The best oh crap moments are when your opposing counsel or opposing client says or does something that wins the case for you. True, in civil cases you usually know what will happen ahead of time. But in my state discovery in smaller civil cases is more limited, and clients don't always want to spend 30k dollars when we can get the same result for 10k dollars. In an adverse possession case the witness only needed to say I use that area as my backyard, and I fully expected him to say this. It would harm my case, but I knew I could get around it. When asked about his use of the area, he said, no, I never really went back there, didn't use it at all, lost the case for the other side, and I could barely keep a straight face. It was completely opposite of what the witness had told opposing counsel off the record. Apparently the under penalty of perjury made him change his story. I had another case about losing multi-unit dwelling insurance because a guy's place was a fire hazard. I asked him if his personal insurer knew about the fire hazard. Yeah, and the jerks cancelled my policy. I also love it when I have a difficult party on the other side and the judge rips them a new one. I had a convoluted case with a lot of parties about nothing at all. The plaintiff was heinous. The six or seven attorneys were working out calendars with the judge when the plaintiff starts yelling at her attorney from across the courtroom because she didn't like that he had conceded some little non-issue. Judge told her to sit down and shut up. I was sad that the case settled because she wouldn't have been amazing on the stand. Not exactly in court, but I was defending a juvenile robbery case, where there was very little evidence. There was supposed to be two guys, but they only picked up this one kid. He had no stolen property on him. He was picked up like outside his own house, wearing different clothes than the victim had initially said. This kid was on the honor roll at school. His family seemed kind and were involved. He wrote poetry and played instruments. I actually believed it was a legit mistaken identity case. I went to meet with one of the kid's mentors for a character reference. And he exactly matched the description of the other robber. I was the dumbass that almost screwed myself. I had two charges in two different courts. I accepted the first plea which almost always carries probation but my plea didn't have that condition. When it came time to accept the second plea, the prosecutor didn't include probation because she assumed my first charge put me on probation. She said as much to the judge and me being a big dummy almost corrected her. My lawyer grabbed my shoulder and, I crap you not, told me to shut the frick up. She doesn't know. You almost became that kid that reminds the teacher about homework or an essay that's due. Lawyers of Reddit, what is the dumbest thing your client has ever done? Wore a shirt that said natural born killer on it to a hearing. For an assault charge, I had him turn it inside out. He went down anyway, but at least it was for, you know, actually assaulting someone, rather than the shirt. My all time favorite is a client I had who was charged with driving under the influence. DUI, who wanted to challenge the charges on the ground as he didn't think he was drunk and the tests was administered improperly, who appeared at his court hearings rip roaring drunk, twice, and then, both times, he got into his car and tried to drive away, and both times, the police promptly stopped him, administered a breathalyzer and charged him with DUI and related offenses, we didn't win that case, I was in court contesting a traffic ticket and saw something like this, the guy was in court for a DUI and was 7 sheets to the wind. He was taken out in shackles. Fell over twice. Told a client don't say anything to the police. Wait until I get there. Confesses to a crime he wasn't being investigated for. Not my client. But I was on the prosecutor's side when a defendant failed to appear for court. His attorney can't reach him. Nobody know where he is. So we all sit there for about half an hour until the judge gets sick of it and moves on with the docket. We found out later that day that the defendant decided to rob a 7 stroke 11 the night before and was sitting in jail two counties over when he should have been in court. Well, he did need money to pay his lawyer. I used to represent patients who were involuntarily committed because of a mental illness, so I wouldn't describe them as dumb, but still. Clark, do you swear to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Client, 
No, this happened a dozen different times. Had a client show up to a child custody hearing high on methamphetamine. When she arrived, she began screaming at the judge and demanding that her no good M head baby daddy be drug tested. I took her in the hallway and told her that if the judge ordered a drug test for the dad, he would have to order one for her. End of argument. I worked for the public defender's office and met a client in jail for a lineup that he had adamantly demanded regarding a crime with multiple witnesses. I met the client for the first time in a separate room to let him know how it would go down and what to expect. This is the kind of lineup you traditionally see on television where there are a number of similar looking people standing shoulder to shoulder in front of mirrored glass. They pull the people for the lineup from the jail population and despite their best efforts this is not a huge population. I walk in to meet the client and he has a sty on his left lower eyelid the size of a golf ball. It was the most identifiable mark on a human's face I have ever seen. He still demanded the lineup and was identified instantly by every single witness without a shred of doubt in their mind. He still demanded a trial and the sty was gone by the time the trial commenced. TL. DR. Guy with golf ball sized lump on face demands comparative lineup. I had one of these. Defendant robbed his friends at gunpoint in their home wearing a Halloween mask he had shown them the day before and wearing a short sleeved shirt that displayed his distinctive sleeve of tattoos. Fasipum. Judge was determining if a defendant qualified for a public defender. Judge, sir, do you have any income? Defendant, yes, your honor. Judge, from what source do you have income? Defendant, selling marijuana, your honor. This happened in Illinois, and the defendant was not under oath. Honesty is the best policy, unless it involves telling a judge you sell weed for a living. I represent clients before the IRS. Had a couple who owed around $250,000 in back taxes. We had no defense, so the only thing to do was have the clients meet with the IRS and plead for leniency. Well, the wife got arrogant with the IRS agent, and at one point stood up and screamed at the IRS agent, who was a pretty decent person, making a very middle class wage. You'll take away my Mercedes over my dead body then she stormed out of the conference room. Needless to say, she lost the Mercedes. Not a lawyer, but this happened in court. My dad was suing a customer for non-payment. The judge ruled in his favor for the whole 15k. The guy he was suing got up to leave, but walked over to my dad and said if you think you are going to see a dime of that money you are a freaking moron. I will kill you first. He then walked away. For a second my dad was worried the guy would get away with the threat. But he didn't worry much because the guy had said it loud enough for the bailiff and the judge to hear. He did not make it out of the courtroom. My dad was a lawyer in the navy. One of his first big cases was defending a guy accused of falling asleep at his post during Vietnam. My dad was all psyched, delivering what he thought was well prepared defense to the judge. The judge interrupted him, telling him to turn around and wake up his client. Guy might have had some type of disorder. A client in a pie case claiming damage to their lower back posted pictures of themselves to their Facebook page riding jet skis and horses. The defense subpoenaed the client's Facebook page. Now that is a job that gets easier thanks to social media. The case had gone on for years. Client was badly injured in a car accident and was about to win millions. Then she posted a Facebook status about her doing something very active and thus negating the entire case. Had to settle for $100,000. Years of work down the drain in one Facebook status. Attorney servant off process. This is Jen from Judge Grandpa Faces office. Your client, who I see is charged with harassing phone calls, left us 87 messages over the weekend. The judge would like a word with you. You see your honor, I couldn't be the one harassing my ex because I spent my weekend harassing you. I had a brilliant gentleman on probation for narcotics trafficking and was not permitted to own use a cell phone. He went in for a drug test with his probation officer, and his cell rang in his pocket. The PO went to take the phone from his pocket and also pulled out a large baggie of C that he brought to his drug test. He wanted that crap tested, for science. A, B and C are drinking and playing cards. A shoots B with a crossbow, just happened to have one. B staggers out into the street where, naturally, he attracts some attention. 
Martha flees. Police follow blood trail back to the scene to find C. My eventual client. Mopping up the blood. Placing the crossbow bolt in a garbage bag. And generally tidying up. Charged with tampering with evidence. I never understood why his internal housewife took over and kept him from calling 911. Fortunately I was not the attorney in question. But, guy is convicted of some traffic related offense. Loses his driver's license effective immediately. Gets in the car and drives home. Along with his lawyer. I remember watching a short little blurb about the number of people that drive to the DMV to get their expired licenses renewed. And even the ones who go, fail the test, then drive home. Not my client and not my case, but a colleague was defending a driver in a wrongful death case. The first question at his deposition was please state your name for the record. The driver stood up and started screaming at the plaintiff's attorney and threatened to kill him. That went well. Dot. I just imagine him finishing his death threats, sitting down, still red in the face, then turning to his lawyer and giving a thumbs up. Didn't happen to me, but happened to an attorney I know. Client shows up for prelim hearing on domestic violence petition, is wearing ratty shirt but his attorney doesn't pay attention to it. Attorney starts arguing and sees a judge turning bright red, fuming with anger. Judge asks the attorney if he spoke with his client about courtroom attire. Attorney looks down. Client is wearing a shirt that says I have the dong so I make the rules. Should have worn his yellow shirt instead. Always works for me. It reminds the judge that you only live once. So he shouldn't put you in jail too long. Story from a friend of mine. He was defending a guy in court. Don't remember what he was charged with. The main witness for prosecution was on the stand, and was asked if she could identify the defendant. She was scanning the courtroom and seemed confused. My friend was already silently celebrating because if she couldn't identify him, he could probably get all charge dropped. As he was mentally adding this case to the win file, he happened to glance over at his client, who had just helpfully raised his hand to make it easier for her to identify him. Even the judge Fassa palmed on that one. My law teacher would tell stories about a juvenile court he used to work in in one of the more questionable areas of California. Apparently they had a real problem with defendants coming in with sagging pants and court officials showing up in beach clothes. The judge finally got so fed up with it that he kept a box of rope for an impromptu belt and a box of neckties behind his desk and he'd begin court proceedings by lobbing ample amounts of both over his stand at anyone he felt was in need of them. The cops in my preliminary hearing showed up in camo shorts and beaters. I was wearing suit and tie. I work as a legal aid lawyer in a Canadian province. I have had many dumb clients, who did many dumb things. Wore a smoke weed everyday t-shirt while attending their drug trafficking producing trial. Attempted to smuggle cigarettes to their inmate partner via their baby's diaper. Intentionally pooped their pants on the way to court to delay their matter. Denied driving under the influence. Upon search by police, a full highball glass of rum and coke was located in their jacket pocket. Debauched a girl. Sent her text messages from his phone the next day recalling all the sordid details. I have many more stories that I could tell if there was sufficient interest. The ones I mentioned here all happened in the past couple of months. More stories. One of my first clients was a delirious hobo. When we were meeting at my office, he was ranting and his dentures fell out and landed on my legal pad. He picked them up and put them back in his mouth and continued to rant as if nothing happened. Same guy appeared in court a few weeks later and refused to let the security detail inspect his hobo bindle. He told them he wasn't going to appear without his bindle and left. He was arrested that afternoon for failure to appear. Guy came in and said he wanted to see Oral-B because their toothbrushes kept cutting his gums. He asked if I wanted to see his evidence. I said no, but he still proceeded to dump a grocery bag of used, slightly bloodied, toothbrushes onto my desk. Another good one. Doing a trial for client in a circuit court about an hour outside of the city I operate in. Client decides to get a cab out there and tells the driver they'll pay them when they arrive. A client arrives in this community and gets the driver to stop at local convenience store across the street from the courthouse. Client proceeds to attempt to steal 5 26 ounce bottles of rum and is promptly arrested and taken into custody. Trial is postponed as we spend the day, unsuccessfully, applying for bail. 
I am not a lawyer but this worked out super well for me. I was hit by the 65 year old drunk lady, who also happened to be on methadone at the time. The cops knew her husband who was a firefighter, and so they didn't breathalyze or do any tests, and didn't charge her with DUI. My MTs had said that lady is so drunk, she's going to buy you a ticket to Disney World, which is how I knew that she was drunk at the time of the accident. But I had no proof to bring to the table in the lawsuit because if the cops didn't charge or make notes then you cannot add it later. So we get to my deposition and she shows up. She argues with me the entire time over my points and her lawyer keeps having to tell her that she needs to be quiet. Mind you, this lady had ruined my friends and my lives. So I was becoming less than patient with her calling me a liar when she got off scot-free. She exclaims to my lawyer even the police report is wrong. What do you mean it's wrong? It has me coming from the wrong place. Where were you coming from? My friend's bar. Comma really? Did you have any drinks at this bar? Well yeah. How many? I don't know. They don't charge me they just keep refilling my class. Cue her lawyer's face palm as this is all on tape. TLDR. Lady exclaims that she was drinking and driving when she could have gotten off scot-free. Karma. Family law case. Judge had asked to interview the minor child in a closed courtroom with no parents. Attorneys could stay. When done, client Ray enters the courtroom to see the child crying and promptly tells the judge that he is freaking retarded. Right up to that point, my client was winning and was about to have the other party's parenting time suspended. The kid had said the other party abuses him and that he did not want to see that parent anymore. Judge was not pleased. Other party's parenting time suspended. My client has anger management classes ordered, fines, psych testing, and drug testing. This is the worst part about people when it comes to family law. They screw themselves over and the judge is honestly looking to do what is best for the child. But if you make a huge scene like you're freaking batchet crazy. During a divorce, the ex-husband claimed that he didn't make much or any money and wasn't able to pay the child support we were asking him to pay. A few hours after receiving this information he posts a picture on his public Facebook of a wad of cash talking about how balan he was. Needless to say his claim didn't hold up after that. In his defense, people who post pictures of cash normally are poor. That's why they're so excited to have whatever money they do have. Not my client in a well-known prisoner civil rights suit, the prisoner, acting pro se of course, filed a motion to kiss my butt in which he requested that America at large, and one corrupt judge bend over and kiss his butt. The motion was denied. I'm going to allow it. At first appearance, a defendant stood there calmly and quietly when the judge was reading his charges and bond information. When the judge asked if the defendant had any questions, the defendant gave the judge the finger and said frick you. Mother sucker, go frick yourself, and then proceeded to throw down the microphone and walk away. The judge, who had been on the bench for years, replied well, I guess I'll let you know when my fan club meets. Bonus, the fan club has its own building, with free meals and exercise facilities. My sister is a public defender. She recently had a shoplifting case where the defendant was caught in possession of stolen goods which happened to match a list, also in his possession, entitled crap to steal from Walmart. So he made a shoplifting list. Client was an accountant for a good size company. During the recession she was laid off and filed for unemployment where claimed she made 200k plus salary. Real salary was 60k. The company received the unemployment claim, investigated, and found out she embezzled millions. Not a lawyer or in any way educated on law and court proceedings and such. So please forgive my ignorance but I want to ask something. Say you're in court and your client does something horribly stupid such as, gives evidence incriminating himself accidentally confesses. What do you do? Do you just sigh, admit you lost, and everything stops or is there any way to salvage that? Just a curious question. So I'm a law student, but I work at a volunteer desk that helps people complete the forms for court. The awful part is I can't give any legal advice since I'm not a lawyer, which means I can't tell these people they don't have a case. However, the stories are great. They're the lady who sues celebrities. She asked me to help her sue Robert De Niro. Someone else helped her with a suit for Matthew McConaughey. 
She was doing it on behalf of her kids and their fathers for in excess of $100 million. She didn't even know how to spell their names. Then, there's the guy who is suing DirecTV, CNN, Fox, and who knows who else. Apparently, he's the one you have to THNK for putting color on your TV shows and adding animation. He was suing because they hadn't paid him, ever. Finally, there's the lady who is suing her former employer for giving her too much money on her last paycheck. She told me they did it because they liked her and wanted her to come back. There was maybe 60 extra dollars on the check. She was suing for $10,000. Not a lawyer but in court for a ticket. Apparently the cop lost the ticket book so there was no official evidence. The judge said, the next 15 on the docket, I was luckily one of the 15. Just needed to say not guilty since there was no evidence. One moron got up there and started to argue that he was only going 5 miles per hour over not 10. The judge looked at him and said son, just say not guilty. The guy again said but I wasn't going that fast. The judge laughed and repeated again, son, just say two words for me, not in guilty. The guy, confused mumbled not guilty in the form of a question. The judge said dismissed. Everyone in the courtroom laughed and clapped for him. I love that I'm 80 some oddin, and this is the first one that didn't result in the person destroying their chances in court. I'm not a lawyer, but the optometrist that I went to had an officer manager that was marking on people's accounts that they got refund checks and crediting the balance, then cashing them herself. She took $50.000 in a year and got caught. When asked why she did it, she said no one told me I couldn't. Airtight argument. So I was representing a kid accused of conspiracy to supply crack C. He was accused of acting as a lookout, warning the others whenever the police were approaching. He had a fantastic case and it looked like he was going to win. On the day of trial he turned up for trial wearing a huge t-shirt with the Warner Brothers logo on. Above and below the WB logo was printed if you see the pigs. Warner brother, he refused to change. Nah blood, no white boy tells me how to dress. He was convicted. Not a lawyer but a legal secretary. It's illegal to kill crocodiles in Australia so our client filmed himself and his friends doing it. Funnily enough, they got caught. Going to be kind of hard to disprove a video that clearly shows the animal being killed and subsequent celebration. Plus photos with the carcass. What an idiot. Another guy robbed the pub he worked for, stole the work ute, drove to the city, went straight to the casino, parked the work car in the lot, lost $10.000 playing blackjack then bought $2.500 and was entertaining them when the cops arrested him. The classic. There are probably others, but I've been doing this for 10 years so they've all blurred together. People are dumb. Not a lawyer here, still in law school, but assisting lawyers with cases. One day, we got involved in a caretaking debate for an old woman. Her daughter and an attorney were declared legal guardians for her, due to dementia and her high age. Her niece got us involved questioning the motives of the daughter as an assigned legal guardian. Long story short, her motives were definitely questionable. She stole ten thousands of dollars and even her mom's vacuum cleaner and silver cutlery, which resulted in the poor woman eating with her fingers. And the case seemed to be a piece of cake for us. Then the niece, our client, took the old lady away to her senior citizen home to guarantee she was taken care well of. Her intentions were gold. Unfortunately, daughter and attorney were still legal guardians and had the right to determine the place of residence. In the end, our client was charged with kidnapping and we lost the case. Moral of the story, don't ever do anything case related before talking to your lawyer. Seriously, don't. My high school best friend's father is a lawyer, and I remember him telling me this story years ago. He gets a client who was being charged with a DUI. He asks the client what happened and the client states that he had two drinks, gets stopped, and the police wrongly charged him with driving under the influence. My friend's dad then looked over the evidence as any good lawyer would do. Come to find out, there was video evidence from a dash cam. Awesome. His client on video was visibly drunk, and he described it as being you'd be stupid to think he was sober. He was convinced there wasn't much he could do with this. There's icing on the cake though. When the police officer went to give him the brief lizard his client has heard stating, I'm too drunk to use this dink thing. 
I'm a law student but I have internship stories. We had a client who was convicted of murdering his stepson. Before passing sentencing the judge asked if he had anything to say to the court. He replied, I only fricked up when I didn't kill my wife too. Life sentence. Another client upon being pulled over and being asked if he had any drugs or alcohol in the car voluntarily told the office that he didn't but did have the H he sold in his hotel room. He then kindly escorted the officer there and gave it to him. We had a client charged with selling C. In order to determine if he qualified for a public defender the judge asked if he had any way he made an income and he replied, well, you know, from selling coke, I bet I can think of more too. Attacked a courtroom deputy during his trial for being a violent diddler. One of the issues was whether or not he was a danger to the community. My lawyer brother once got a contempt of court charge dismissed against his client by begging for mercy. Using a Forrest Gump like defense my client is not a smart man. Immediately after the charge was dismissed, the client turned and in front of the entire court punched my brother in the mouth. Yelling who are you calling dumb client was promptly re-arrested. Arguing for my client to be released on his own recog. The judge asks him where he is going to live with my fiance. He says, he spins a lovely tale about how wonderful his fiance is, how supportive. Did he mention they are having a baby and he wants to get out of jail and take care of his soon to be wife and kid to support them properly? The judge asks the courtroom, could defendant's fiance please approach the bench? From opposite sides of the room, two women stand up and start walking to the front. One is about 4 months pregnant and the other is nearly 9 months pregnant. They are looking at each other with identical expressions of who the frick are you you could see the exact moment when each of them realized that B is fricking my man. The fight started before they even got to counsel's table. Pregnancy or not, these chicks were seriously trying to kill one another. The bailiffs had to stop laughing long enough to break up the fight. My client says, frick, your honor, I didn't think they'd both come. The judge said he was denying bail for my client's own protection. Not my client, but a lawyer friend of mine had a client who went on a double date with his friend. He and his friend decided it would be a good idea to frick their respective dates in his van. The problem is, they had only one condom. They decided to share it. After one finished, the other proceeded to invert the dirty condom and frick his girl. The girl got pregnant from his friend's sperm that was on the condom that he was wearing. The result, a very messy paternity suit. Not a lawyer, but a paralegal and my the list of dumb I've seen would stretch to the moon. The list of mean would be twice as long. Some examples, not a client, but a defendant who took revenge on his girlfriend by gluing down everything in her apartment. Glued pillows to the bed and couch, the ashtray and phone to the coffee table and even glued the vacuum cleaner to the carpet. Going to add another dumb one, not showing up for court. Had a defendant client with a very simple traffic issue but he would not come to court. Now, he had an attorney, a good one, who had negotiated a sweet, sweet deal. But since he wouldn't come to court, the judge put a warrant out for his arrest. No big whoop. We find the client, arrange for him to come to court on the next available day and file the appropriate motions to have the warrant lifted. And guess what? He doesn't show. So now, his sweet deal is blown. He's incurred $600 to $700 in additional attorney fees for the extra work and there's still a warrant out for his arrest. Dumbass. The glue thing sounds like art. I'd pay to see that. Lawyers of Reddit. What is a detail that your client failed to bring up to you that completely lost you the case? Not my client, but the son of the opposing party, and presumably the party himself, lied about being blind to make himself seem more sympathetic as a witness. We didn't know either until he took the witness box, their counsel asked him to take the oath, and he picked the card up and read it. That was the cherry on top of a series of ridiculous events. The judge dismissed the whole thing in our client's favor shortly after. I was a trainee at the time, but my boss, who was in her late 60s then, said it was the most ridiculous case she'd ever handled. Comma and he picked the card up and read it. I was expecting he easily walked up or sat down, not that he was stupid enough to actually read something out. I wasn't a lawyer in this role, but was a law clerk. This was a typical divorce case. This particular jury trial was about splitting assets and who would get what. It was a long drawn out case that took about 5 days. 
right before the closing arguments the attorneys wanted to talk to the judge, it seems as though a couple of days prior the couple decided to get back together, and instead of telling the judge and their lawyers, they just kept it a secret, we heard 4 days of evidence, arguments, brought in experts such as land assessors, financial planning people and the like and they were back together, one of the attorneys asked to be dismissed from the case immediately and walked out the courtroom. The judge had to dismiss the jury and that the couple was adamant that they didn't think that them getting back together was a detail any of their attorneys needed to know. Yes, in some states there are jury trials for divorces, however this particular case wasn't for the divorce, but for a cause of action stemming from the divorce, marital property, it was a jury trial. I'm a public defender in an area with lots of MUs, M makes most people talk, a lot. So I can't tell you how many clients forget to mention that they got to the jail still high and called their mom girlfriend buddy on the recorded jail phone and not only confessed to the crime, but also brainstormed whatever alibi or version of events I'm relying on to defend them. I'm seeing this question a lot, so I'll add some info here. This is not legal advice, just explaining things a bit more. Calls to a lawyer are privileged, and generally go through dedicated lines that aren't recorded, depending on the facility. Calls to family, friends, etc through the normal phones are not privileged, are generally recorded, and can be used in court. There are usually printed signs near the phones and a recorded warning before each call that this is the case. I heard of a guy trying to appeal his disability benefit being revoked. He was supposedly a paraplegic. But the opposition had over 10 minutes of video footage of him walking, running and even jumping over a fence. After the 1 minute mark, the judge said ok I've seen enough, please leave. Credit card theft fraud case. When I was a young lawyer back in the late 80s I was trying this guy on a CC case and the witness was the department store clerk. Before video surveillance the state relied heavily on witness identification, as she described the customer that was purchasing the very unique clothing her store sold I asked her how could she be so sure it was my client. She looked at my client who was wearing the most obnoxiously yellow shirt imaginable and said because not only does he completely match the description I just gave you but he's wearing the exact same shirt I sold him. The jury convicted him and I learned that day to better prepare my clients for trial. There's a rule you're supposed to follow when questioning trial witnesses and that rule is to never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Despite this rule, lawyers often ask small, apparently inconsequential questions which are necessary to set the scene but are so inconsequential or obvious that their answers are fairly presumed. This case was an exception to that general presumption. The defendant was arrested on a warrant and transported to jail. After booking him into jail, the officer returned to his vehicle and discovered a baggie of drugs sitting right in the middle of the back seat. The defendant was charged with possession. At trial, the officer explained that he routinely searches his vehicle before his shift starts and after any time he transports someone in the back seat. The defense attorney tried to poke holes in the story but the officer's testimony was remarkably call consistent. The officer was fastidious about checking his vehicle. The appearance of the drugs coincided with the defendant's presence in the vehicle. Then, as the defense attorney was running out of questions, he threw out the question, was there anyone else in the backseat of the vehicle? It was a Hail Mary. Even when there are multiple arrests, police tend not to transport more than one arrestee at a time if they can help it. There was no reason to believe anyone else could have feasibly been in the backseat with the defendant. Though it's no surprise to you, the defense attorney and prosecutor were stunned when the answer came back as yes. Turns out, the defendant was with his girlfriend when he was arrested and the officer courteously agreed to drive her to her apartment before taking her boyfriend to jail. This fact was not included in the police report, the officer never told the prosecutor, and, shockingly, the defendant never told his attorney. There was a palpable pause as this fact sunk in. Since there was another person in the back seat, there was more than enough reasonable doubt. Proofs were concluded and the prosecutor threw out a half-hearted closing. The not guilty verdict was a given. Because of this case, I learned to never assume a fact no matter how obvious it may seems. 
I am actually a lawyer, but I was only watching this trial, not participating. So the case was, that woman A had hit woman B in the head with a heavy beer pint at a bar, and woman B got pretty serious injuries. The defense claimed that woman A had not hit anyone with the pint, but instead had just thrown the pint into a random direction, and it happened to hit B in the head, thus it was an accident and not a battery. Well, the prosecution had a CCTV tape from the bar, and it was shown at the trial, and the tape clearly showed in HD as A walked behind B, and smashed the pint to her head so hard that the pint shattered on impact. I looked at the defense lawyer and his jaw literally almost hit the table. The prosecutor also noticed this and asked something along. Thrown. A and the defense lawyer said that due to technical difficulties he couldn't get the CCTV tape open on his computer when he was reviewing the evidence. Woman A was found guilty, so yeah, I was completely dumbfounded. My father is a judge. I remember him talking about a case where a woman was suing for a severe back injury that she said was preventing her from working and taking care of her kids and so on. In the middle of the trial a pen rolled off the table and she is bending over trying to reach it from her chair, but pen was too far away. So she stands up and bends over and picks it up and goes back to her seat as if nothing is out of the ordinary. My dad is just looking at her and she snaps at my dad and goes what are you staring at? My dad asked her if she was okay and her response was that she was fine. Her attorney leaned over and said something to her and she then loudly started complaining about her back and how much her back hurt but no one believed her lol. Ian all. And it's not even my stories but my dad's. He was working as a fraud investigator for an insurance company. I have a few stories of his but here's two of them. Guy was claiming theft of multiple items but mainly a ring. Things weren't adding up so my dad and the insurance company's lawyer decided to do a depot of him. Guy shows up and is doing the depot when my dad notices the guy is wearing the exact ring he's claiming was stolen. My dad slides a note to the lawyer telling him the guy's wearing the ring. Once the note got slid the guy realized what happened and put his hands under the table and took the ring off. They asked him to stand up and lo and behold the ring fell to the ground. Another one is a guy claiming a break in and theft. Immediately things weren't adding up as the window was broken out instead of in. The guy submitted polaroids of items he claimed were his like TVs and such. Thing is in the polaroids you could see the reflection of the store they were in on the glass. He also claimed numerous CDs records but oddly enough every single one started with an R, S, or a T. We're talking 100s of CDs records. My dad was about to deny the claim in person but noticed he had a gun on the table so decided to do it over the phone. Ready for an escalation? Later the same guy was arrested for beheading a prostitute and throwing her head in the river. That went from zero to life in a heartbeat. This one ended my marriage? Well, it was the start of the end of marriage. My husband lost his job in the title mortgage business. Applied for unemployment. Got denied. I decide to help him. With his appeal hearing. I asked him multiple times before the hearing is there anything you did that caused them fire you he says no absolutely not they fired him out of nowhere. Hearing day comes. He testifies under oath that he did nothing wrong. Was a good employee. No issues. Upon cross examination. The other attorney pulls out documents from one of his real estate closings. Documents he forged and backdated. Had to admit he perjured himself. Needless to say he didn't get unemployment and he didn't sleep at home that night. Not my case, which is a gift from above, really. Civil trial before a jury for injuries and prop damage from a MVA, and punitive damages because defendant was intoxicated at the time of the accident, let's call defendant, DUI, almost doesn't need to be said but, before DUI ever stepped foot in court, they would have been prepped repeatedly, first for the deposition and then for trial testimony, with the standard questions, were there any prior incidents? arrests convictions, anything that can be used to impeach any of DUI's testimony, yada yada, over hours, denies everything and is as clean as a clean whistle, thus, at trial, defense counsel, DC, puts DUI on the stand to give them an opportunity to tell the jury of their contrition for this one time error in judgment, describe the difficult time DUI was going through at the time and otherwise show themselves to the jury as an upstanding member of society in order to reduce punitive damages. It goes well. Then plaintiff's counsel, PA, gets to cross. I'm going to paraphrase what allegedly happened next. 
which is purely hearsay. PA. Earlier, you testified that this was a one-time mistake and you've learned your lesson. Is that correct? DUI. Yes. PA. Isn't it true that you've already been convicted of DUI in another state? DUI sits silent as DC immediately objects but it's properly overruled and DUI must answer. Since what happens next is impeachment, I'll skip the objections but suffice to say they were being fired off as rapidly as a machine gun, and just as rapidly overruled. DUI. Yes. PA. And isn't it true that, in your prior DUI, a child died? You can imagine what's happening in the courtroom and, most importantly, amongst the jury. And you think it's over. Stick a fork in DUI. It's done. But then, PA goes for the jugular. Do you remember the name of that little child that you killed while you were driving while intoxicated? Imo. This question is one for the ages. More powerful than the old when did you stop beating your wife? Because no matter how you answer. And that is why you never, ever lie to your attorney. I had a client who, despite being a large man, had been domestically abused by his much smaller wife throughout their marriage. After the divorce she turned her anger on their son. He ran away one day to live with his dad and we filed to restrict her parenting time and for a permanent modification. At the permanent hearing she denied being abusive to the child or my client in front of the child, said she never threatened anyone ever, and that she never made disparaging remarks about my client in front of their son. What she didn't know, and therefore hadn't told her attorney, is that he had recorded multiple instances of her abuse. So I called my client back up for rebuttal and played an audio recording of her screaming at my client, threatening to break his face in, and calling him a loser, all while the child could be heard in the background begging her to stop. I looked over at the other attorney and she had her face in her hands. We won. Not me, but my mentor. This is the reason you never ask questions that you don't already know the answer to in court. During the trial with the judge on a divorce matter, the wife brought up that he had abused her during the course of their marriage. Client whispers to my mentor that that is absolutely not true. On the stand, during his portion of testimony, my mentor asks, at any point in the marriage, did you lay your hands on your wife? One time we were having an argument and I held her down on the couch until she stopped arguing with me. What? My mentor said it was like she could see it happening in slow motion and all the alarm bells were going off in her head because he had never mentioned this and, apparently, to him, this was not abuse. The judge gave wife a lot more money as a result and husband was baffled. My mentor was fuming. ETA. Husband admitted this was the only time he had laid hands on wife. My mentor was more peeved because she had thought the case was in the bag since wife had abandoned the kids with husband to run off with her lover down in Florida and literally only came back to the state to get the divorce done. Husband had been noted as being a great dad to the kids and a good figure in the community. Hence why she was so dang shocked at his answer. But your honor I wasn't using my hands. I was about to complete a land transaction which required my client to have built a road. Indeed. The entire point of the transfer was the road. My client, as I call him prior to completion, turns out we, I, didn't build the road. I was approached by this attorney to work for him for free to go after smugglers. This guy had been arrested for dumping goods onto American markets that violated trade agreements. In his arrest, a bunch of goods were left in warehouses to rot, and their owners, his clients, were never paid. This attorney showed me that this smuggler had assets, and that he had gone to the criminal trial and gotten the judge to set aside $2 million of the criminal penalties to settle his client's debts. He had receipts, invoices, all of the paperwork. He just needed associates to help him take the case to trial. He wanted me to work for free, but he would pay me on contingency once he obtained the verdict. He had two other attorneys working for him with the same deal. I worked on the case for a short while, but luckily moved on to other things. The other two attorneys worked on that case for over two years. At one point, they negotiated a $1.50 million settlement of all claims. The attorney in charge rejected the offer, because he was convinced he could get twice as much at trial. In the end, the case settled for $200k, because none of the clients would enter the United States to testify for fear of being arrested. The two associates got $8 K apiece for two years of work. Years ago, I had a client charged with drunk in public. 
It's a minor infraction, but he was on probation so he needed to fight it. He told me he was very drunk that night, but had made it to the lobby of his brother's apartment and was waiting for him to come down to get him upstairs. I take this information and run with it, bringing photos of the apartment complex in the bylaws to court. My goal was to prove that the lobby of the apartment was secured to guests and residents only, which would arguably take the drunkenness out of being in public. There is no formal discovery for minor infractions in my state, since there isn't a real option for a plea deal on the minor charge and wanting to ambush the officer with my argument. I do not discuss the case with him and we go to trial. The wheels came off the wagon when the officer testified that he encountered my client at an apartment building on the other side of the city. He was outside at the call box, not even in the lobby of this different building, rambling AMD barely able to stand. I'm whispering to my client about this reversal and he slumps over and says something to the effects of sorry, I meant to go to my brother's apartment, maybe that's why he couldn't find me, and he sounded angry on that phone, cross examination was not fruitful, it was basically officer, are you really sure it happened where you said it did and not at this other apartment building miles away closing argument, that he wasn't that drunk, also didn't get us anywhere, in the end, there was a fast guilty finding. A minor fine, wasted ink and paper from printing useless exhibits, and light sanctions later on the probation violation. I would have used the Ole Ron White defense. I wasn't drunk in public until they threw me out of the bar and into the public. I'm still a law student and this happened during my first internship at a court. A girl among other people was charged with drug possession but because she had thrown away the drugs and the police couldn't prove that she bought or owned the drugs, BC it could have been one of the other people as well who still had drugs on them. Full stop. The judge ruled in dubio pro rio. He then asked if she wants to say add something and this girl asked if she can get her drugs back. The defense attorney looked like he was about to get a heart attack. For those wondering I know what in dubio pro rio means but I wasn't sure if they use the term in other countries and tried to explain it if not. This happened in Germany. I really don't want to believe anyone is that stupid. Employment law matter. He claimed to have been unfairly dismissed over bogus performance management. The real reason. He organized via Craigslist to have someone collect a box of his CM from a children's playground. There were explicit messages from him asking what they did with it, and whether they rubbed it all over themselves. The employer provided us the messages. He was doing this on company time. I was actually on a jury. Guy was suing a business. Said he got injured. Couldn't work for 3 years. Defense counsel sir, isn't it true that you spent 18 of those months in prison for armed robbery? Guy was saying he was shopping at a major grocery store chain and slipped in some water on the ground in front of a freezer. Guy has cell phone video his wife made of him in the water and we could hear her saying that the water wasn't showing up on video and to splash it with his hand so it would look better in the video. It also came out that he'd had 3 prior convictions for crimes of dishonesty. That may not be the exact term, but something similar. For things like shoplifting and other petty crimes. Second edit for more info while I'm on my lunch break. Guy was representing himself pro se. Defense counsel asked him if his inability to work could be from the two previous knee injuries he'd had. When asked how they knew about those injuries he was told his previous lawyer had given the defense's medical records upon request. Guy wanted to enter his MRIs as evidence, but had no one there as an expert witness to explain to the jury what they showed. He wanted to show us what the results were. Reminds me of a lucky guy who slipped on PP at the Costco. Not mine but went to court over a ticket. Lady was in front of me for DUI and hit and run. The judge assigns a lawyer for her since she was so shook she quit her job. The judge asked the prosecuting attorney for details on the case she legit says you mean that car I hit while I was an intoxicated. The judge stops takes his glasses off and says everything is recorded in this courtroom. I told you not to talk to anyone about your case except the attorney that I assigned for you. You could tell he was ready to walk out of the room with the level of stupidity this lady showed. UK not a lawyer as such, but a planning consultant. Client signed sworn affidavit stating he'd been running a truck park business for over 10 years on a piece of land. After 10 years the use becomes immune from legal action. The council checked Google Maps and saw immediately he lied. 
had only ran the business for 7 years. He had committed a criminal offense by submitting a false sworn affidavit. Plonka. Sounds like something typical of owners of truck parks etc. My dad was for many years involved in ensuring these kind of people waste disposal firms etc operate in compliance with environmental law. He had no end of tales about how impossible they were to work with, even when they weren't in the wrong. It's a shady field of business. When I was an intern at court I was watching a battery trial with another intern. The defendant was asked if he can remember how many people were present when he beat up the other guy. He then points at my fellow intern and says rather loudly, she was there but she didn't see anything. Don't trust her. Of course she wasn't there and the defendant was found guilty. A defendant was written a cell phone ticket while driving and defended himself. Your honor I was not using a smartphone while driving. I was actually using a flip phone. Guilty. Unfair dismissal case. The client claimed to have been dismissed without reason or following procedure. After we had started the case, it comes out that not only was he given three written warnings but he was also called in for a disciplinary hearing before his dismissal. Don't lie to your lawyer. Similar to a doctor, I feel like not telling your lawyer everything can just hurt you. Not a lawyer, but going to law school. I worked for a defense attorney who did a lot of federal work. One of our cases was with this guy charged with flesh trafficking of minors. We met him at the prison to interview him and he swore up and down he had nothing to do with this and that he didn't even know the girls. A month or so later, heaps of evidence from the US attorney's office comes in and it's pages of snapchat messages and texts between him and these girls, video confessions from every co-defendant and victim saying our guy was the ringleader. Proof of him checking in out of different motel rooms, etc. We showed him the evidence and he claimed his co-defendants were conspiring against him. He continued to deny everything and wanted to go to trial but we repeatedly told him that would not be wise because of all the evidence against him. He ended up requesting a new attorney to be appointed claiming that we were ineffective. To this day my old boss and I reminisce about how difficult this client was when we catch up on the phone. Estate matter. Client neglected to tell me he had four children from a previous marriage. Guess who showed up to challenge the will after he died? They lost. But I would have drafted his will differently had I known. Not a lawyer but a woman I know received several hefty speeding fines. In my country you can go see a magistrate to have the fines reduced if you plead poverty. But she heard about this and decided to give it a shot. So she went to court and told the magistrate a sob story about not having enough money. The magistrate heard her out. Then he asked her, Madam, what type of car do you drive? She replied in a tiny voice, a Porsche. Anyone saying that a Porsche doesn't necessarily cost that much and isn't indicative of her financial status. So I'll add that it was not a beat up or old model at the time. She could have paid the fines without breaking the bank. She was just pushing her luck. She's a wealthy woman who just didn't want to pay her fines and the magistrate wasn't having any of it. Not a lawyer but was in court to testify on another case. Accused is pleading guilty and judge tells him to allocute and describe the crime. After the defendant gives a detailed confession the judge glances at the paperwork and says Mr. So and so. That's not what you are accused of the guy groans and says oh. That's the other county. Lawyers of Reddit. What's your best most bad as I rest my case moment? As a young attorney, I had stated a claim that an insurance company was dragging out a case in bad faith, in hopes that my elderly client would die before they had to pay him. I was requesting that the trial day be given priority due to my client's advanced age. The judge was no spring chicken himself, and seemed skeptical when he asked exactly how old my client was. Maybe thinking that he was in his 70s and must merely seem ancient to a baby lawyer like me. When I responded that my client was 92, and the case has already gone on for 5 years, the judge was visibly shocked, and immediately granted my motion for priority, shutting down the insurance company's attorney's attempt to respond. They wrote us a check for a million dollars the next week. Too bad those buttholes already deprived him of 5 years of enjoying that check. I was representing a woman with a severe neck injury. Opposing counsel presented a test result that showed her cervical exam was normal. I felt almost bad when I pointed out he had the wrong cervical area in mind. 
I wonder how red his face got. If I was that lady I'd have made my neck injury worse from throwing my head back and laughter. I was a second year associate and handling my first trial. I represented the plaintiff. The defendant had an expert witness who had testified previously in about 40 similar cases. This expert came out of my client's property and did a completely bulls examination of the issue and his expert report was equally as bulls. For those of you that don't know, expert testimony needs to meet a certain standard. The Daubert standard, at least in my state, in order to be admissible. This guy basically took some photos and put a ruler on the ground a few times to make his report seem legit. The partners at my firm told me it wasn't worth trying to file a Daubert motion to strike his report testimony because the case was low value under $100k. And those types of motions can be very complex and didn't want to bill the client for it. I was so angry about this guy being deemed an expert that I came in on a weekend, on my own time, and drafted a 20 page motion to strike his testimony. I didn't bill the client a dime. The defendant didn't file a response to my Daubert motion to strike. Instead, they waited until right before the expert was set to testify. He had been sitting in court racking up fees for two full days beforehand. The judge had the jury leave the room put the expert on the stand, and allowed the defendant to do a direct examination of their expert. The defendant's attorney, not taking my motion seriously, had their inexperienced associate, just like me, do the examination. It was incredibly basic and didn't respond to any of the points in my motion. I was in charge of doing his cross exam. It was my first cross exam of a witness, ever. I told the guy, a seasoned expert witness, apart on the stand. I got his entire testimony and report struck. They also had a second expert witness, who was pretty terrible but not quite as terrible. I also did his cross exam, realizing that they were in serious trouble without their primary expert, and their second expert at risk of getting struck. The lead counsel for the defendant, a named partner at a well known firm, did the direct exam for the second expert. I again did the cross. I got the second expert's testimony struck except for one very, very tiny area. So essentially he was forced to testify with both hands tied behind his back. It was the most gratifying moment of my legal career so far. We had a case where opposing counsel was cross-examining our expert witness on hydrology regarding some silt runoff issues. Mr. Smith. Wouldn't you agree that the book I'm holding is highly respected in your field and considered to be the gold standard on the subject? Witness I am aware that it is highly regarded in my field. Would you be willing to explain, in your own words, what paragraph 6-10 on page 121 is describing? Witness reads the passage word for word. Yes, I can read. But could you put this passage in your own words for the court? Witness these are my own words. I wrote it. We were the defendants. We were being sued by Idaho over silt in a lake. We were able to prove that we weren't responsible and prevailed. It actually originated from another site and entered the lake. Elsewhere. However, that site was owned by a very large corporation and I don't think the Hoa wanted to fight with an entity that could fight forever. My sister got t-boned by a car, causing a concussion when I was younger. Long story short, we were in court with the judge who asked the driver if he had ever sped before. No, your honor, I never speed was his reply. The judge asked him a couple more times if he was sure, if he never sped, ever. The driver was adamant that he never sped and never had before. A few minutes later, my sister's lawyer gave the judge some paperwork. She read it, and said to the driver, it seems that you have some past driving violations. Can you tell me what they are for? Speeding. The driver had to pay medical bills for my sister. I feel like never is not a word that should be said in the courtroom. Not to my recollection probably would have saved an additional perjury charge. I'm relatively junior so I'm hoping to beat this one day. I defend professionals and brought a motion to dismiss a case on the basis that the plaintiff could not prove my client was negligent as she had not served the required expert evidence. As opposing counsel and I waited for our motion to be heard we were sitting in the courtroom. The judge, who I did not know and who had not read our materials, wanted to talk to the parties of a short trial which was to be heard after our motion was argued. That matter was also a professional negligence matter and the plaintiffs had no expert support. 
The judge then spent 10 minutes explaining that he had practiced in professional negligence for many years and was well versed in the evidentiary requirements to prove the elements of professional negligence. In fact, he said, I very rarely use the word impossible in this courtroom, but it is impossible for you to be successful without expert evidence. Our matter was then called and I reveled in explaining to the judge that he was about to hear a motion to dismiss a professional negligence case on the basis that the plaintiff had no expert evidence. I won. So I call up my client's disgruntled former employee about a contract dispute that he started and that got my client into litigation. After two questions, it was obvious he was a lying son of a bee. I didn't want to call him as a witness. He was prone to act unpredictably. I took down his story as we talked, which was easily proven false by documents and which cast my client in a false and bad light. I did not tell him how I'd caught him in lies. Fast forward one day, I submit a list of known witnesses to opposing counsel, as required by the rules. Witness number one was the lying sack of crap. Fast forward to trial. My opposing counsel calls the lying sack of crap as his first witness and the lying sack of crap acts like a lying sack of crap. He tells the same story on the witness stand that he told me on the phone. I took emails that he wrote and entered them into evidence and proved him a clear liar. My client didn't breach the contract, the party suing did. After the lying sack of crap left the witness stand, I asked the court for a brief recess. Granted, I approached opposing counsel. My client was still willing to sign on to the walk away settlement where no money changes hands and no fault was admitted. We offered the deal two months before and it was angrily rejected. Now, suddenly, it was accepted. Score. Corporate lawyer. So I don't have cases to rest. But once opposing counsel was forcefully insisting that it was ridiculous for me to expect a certain provision in a contract we were negotiating. And I pointed out that this provision was standard in his own firm's contract forms. As I knew from several prior transactions I'd worked on across from them. Pretty exciting stuff. He took it in stride and said, jokingly, well, of course it's fine when we ask for it. I represented a company that was sued for breach of contract by a former independent contractor. Dude basically alleged that my client wasn't paying him correctly in accordance with the contract. During his deposition, Dude admits that he never reviewed any documents to make sure his allegations were true. Never reviewed his complaint before filing it to make sure the allegations in it were true. And had no idea whether or not my client actually failed to pay him in accordance with the contract. Basically, he tells me that he was suing my client because he didn't think their agreement was fair. Even though he agreed to the terms when he signed the contract. The kicker is that he admitted that he owed my client money. At arbitration, he tries to flip his story and starts giving testimony that is the exact opposite of his debt. So I whip out his transcript and undermine his testimony bit by bit. Needless to say, I won that case. Username checks out. Pretty satisfying story too. Not a case winning moment, but a motion winning one for sure. Think of cases like a big conflict, with motion hearings as little conflicts. Opposing attorney was insisting that rule A meant they could do X. I tried, multiple times, to point out rule A literally did not say that. During the hearing, the judge reached behind them, grabbed their rules of civil procedure, basically a dictionary of rules, placed it in front of the other attorney, and said show me where rule A says X. Other attorney did not take the hint, read rules out loud for a brutal 5 minutes, and gave the book back. I said judge I have nothing to add, it was pretty fun. Oh, that had to be excruciating for everyone, especially the court reporter. Opposing counsel decided that I had coached my witness and gave him lines to repeat, that he was lying. Short version is that he asked the witness if he spoke to me before he testified. Witness said he had. Attorney looked like he thought he had me. Attorney asked the witness what I told him, what instructions I gave him. Witness looked him dead in the eye and said, first thing he told me was to tell the truth no matter what. He said the lawyer is never the one who goes to jail, that he isn't going to jail for me, and if I lie, I'm on my own. Attorney looked like someone took the air out of him. Everyone in the courtroom simultaneously looked at me. Only time I've smirked or laughed in court. I wanted to put my feet up on the table like I was Vincent Laguardia Gambani, hands behind my head, and say, I'm done with this guy. 
a lawyer friend of mine had written a blog post about a legal subject, opposing counsel filed a motion again. As others pointed out, this is like the small battles which are part of the overall war of the lawsuit, in which they had to cite their reasoning for their arguments. In this particular motion they chose to dig through the website of my friend where they found that blog post which they chose to cite in their own arguments. Basically, they were going for an aha moment. You can't argue against us because you yourself once wrote something which we think agrees with our point of view. Rather than dispute the nitty gritty details of their argument, my attorney friend simply responded with something along the lines of I am honored to be cited as an expert in this area by my esteemed opposing counsel. Now, as their chosen expert, let me tell you what the law means and why they are wrong. It was glorious. They very quickly revised their argument. I was on the losing end. Represented a guy who had bought a company and the company failed spectacularly within months due to a number of reasons I could attribute to the seller, and they had clearly lied about the company's finances to induce him to buy. I was suing to rescind the deal, have your crappy company back and give my guy his money back. I laid out my huge case and thought I had it in the bag, and then opposing counsel asked my guy, isn't it true that you listed this business for sale a month ago? Yes. And you did sell it correct? You signed a purchase and sale? Yes but he never finished paying me. He has more payments to make. I'll just give his money back when you guys give me my money back. My idiot client had me suing over a company that he had legally sold. Sucker never told me. Game over on the spot. I'm not an attorney, and it wasn't in front of a judge, but I got into a dispute with a contractor who freaked up royally when installing a new heating system, resulting in an asbestos contamination of my house. Their insurance argued the contractor couldn't have caused the contamination, because the contamination was way worse than could have been possible from what the contractor did, which is bulls. They argued the contamination must have been caused by the contractor that installed the previous heating system. It was super satisfying to write our response. 1. The previous heating system was placed 12 years earlier. The asbestos dust was visibly lying everywhere. Arguing we didn't vacuum for 12 years was beyond ridiculous. 2. The asbestos dust was on a floor we installed 6 months earlier. Included the receipt for the floor. And then the third point was the most fun to write. 3. I said they were welcome to believe the contamination was caused by the contractor who installed the previous system 12 years ago. I included the receipt of that installation. It was done by the same contractor. The next letter was very brief, stating they would pay us for all damages we were claiming. Not a lawyer, but during a particularly nasty employment mediation hearing, I got to ask my former employer a question about payments per employment law. Me. Did you or did you not pay into state mandated unemployment insurance fund for all your employees past and present? Silence. Mediator. Sir. Answer the question. Silence. Mediator. Well, let me ask it. Did you or did you not pay into state mandated unemployment insurance fund for all your employees past and present? Silence. Mediator. I'll take that as a no. When I was in law school, I had to argue a case for an exam. I was the last in my class to go so there wasn't anyone arguing against me. I opened with a motion to dismiss and supposing had failed to show. The judge grading me chuckled and said to Shea counsel, I still had to go forward but we got off on the right foot and I ended up with an A. Genius. Lawyers of Reddit, at what point, when working for a defendant, did you realize, my client is a monster? Not a defendant, but a divorce. Client is a late 30s woman. Two kids, idyllic suburban life with her, incredibly lucrative medical profession, husband. He caught her cheating, he wanted to patch things up, she decided on a divorce. So far, nothing out of the ordinary, unfortunately, then I start getting the details. He caught her on his birthday, in their bed, while the kids were downstairs. Dude decided to come home early as a surprise, and his wife was getting dicked down by a 19 year old, but wait. There's more. Really fun stuff from the husband. Guy had been treated for gonorrhea twice, and both times he had caught it from his wife. The second kid wasn't his, it was obvious because the child was 100%, some race, and the dad was, not that race. Bad stuff, right? Well, enter the texts, emails, etc. She was carrying on like a dozen affairs at any given time. 
spanning years, she would bring them home, and tell the kids they were electricians, plumbers, etc. She'd frick other guys within minutes of dropping her kids off at school. I've met some awful people in my time, but this woman straight up told me how much this guy loved her and how she manipulated the crap out of him. He knew about a lot of the stuff, and each time he found something new he just tried to win her back. I don't want to go into the details of what happened, but some money that you get you don't really want. That's really sad. I hope that dude found happiness. Basically he was watching his neighbor through the window in various stages of undress, got worked up. Minutes later the victim showed up at his shop to purchase some food, she was alone. He closed the door behind her and yeah, well that's it. Prick got 25 years for that. That girl was 7 7 freaking years old. You have no idea how often in our country the mentality of well if I'm worked up and there is a possibility of release close by, regardless of whom or what or what age or consenting or not that possibility is or might be, I'm entitled to take it, surfaces. Welcome to South Africa. The adverts on TV showing Table Mountain and the Ocean is a load of crap. 47 violent murders every day. One in three of every woman killed is murdered by her own spouse or partner. For those asking what's wrong with allowing the child to choose, the answer is nothing, so long as the child has the maturity and mental capacity to do so, and wants to choose. This child had none of those things, and was forced to choose right then and there between two people the child loved very much. Also, I'm not making any commentary on which spouse was better, they both did this, ergo, they are both terrible, not a lawyer but was a paralegal for many years. I worked mainly in family law, as I am sure other posters are doing in order to preserve confidentiality. I am going to be vague and also not include genders or locations. I had a client who was getting divorced. The client and soon-to-be ex-spouse had a 12-year-old son with autism. The two of them sat this poor freaking child down at the table one day and made him choose which parent he wanted to live with. Our client called me to gloat that the child had chosen in their favor and to direct that paperwork be prepared. This client was a prominent member of the business community and earned quite a high salary, and was treating this child like a commodity. I was disgusted. I no longer work in law, but this one will always stick with me. One of my close friends is a family lawyer and had a similar situation in except in reverse. Both the client and the client's spouse, in front of a judge and in front of their autistic child, took turns arguing why they shouldn't have to have custody. Both of them claiming they are too busy, their ex is better suited to be a parent, the child clearly prefers the other one more, etc. That poor kid. Had a client charged with bestiality with his pet goat. Pictures of his undies full of goat hair and his bed littered with goat poo was something the like I have never seen in my career. When after the charges were dismissed, he asked me for help getting the goat back. SMH. Found a Burforth Dumbledore's lawyer. Not a lawyer but friend's dad is. He had a 48 year old manager from a janky sub shop that was trying to sue his 16 year old employee for defamation after the 48 year old took the 16 year old's phone and was looking at the nudes of his 16 year old girlfriend and attempting to send them to himself. The kid went and told everybody and the manager found out and tried to sue him. Like you dumb frick. Why would you go and tell a legal team that you got caught attempting to put child pee on your phone frick man. A monster and a freaking idiot. Lifelong criminal defense lawyer here. To be completely honest, it's not about the offense but about the person. I've had people accused of murder that I really kind of liked and thought well of. I've had people accused of shoplifting who have given me the heebie-jeebies and seemed like psychopaths. Speaking from purely a criminal standpoint, having a client who is a monster doesn't matter in terms of your duty to them. But it does make the job less pleasant. My worst clients have been people who are comfortable scamming others of their money. Not a lawyer but a client of one I overheard a case of. This woman wanting her US citizenship married an older man who was never hands on. Basically when the man went to file taxes he had someone do it for him. She made a deal with this person. They transferred his entire estate and accounts to her, but her citizenship hadn't been fully established as this was roughly a week into the false marriage. All of the older gentleman's money and assets were frozen because a foreign citizen owned them. The case is still stuck in legal heck and I don't know what happened later. Murder. 
robbery, and most crimes involve regular people who did or may have done something stupid due to alcohol or situations. But the clients you keep an eye out are the ones charged with fraud and the like. Liars, cheats and all around shady people generally speaking. Even the gangs operate on a code of conduct. An old fashioned war like code of conduct. Honor and courage are important to them even though they commit crimes. 22 years threatened twice, so not that bad. The real danger? Not in criminal law, it's family law. That's where people get really heated. It's personal. Prosecutor here. Most of us in this profession have the utmost respect for those on the other side of the aisle. Most people really don't know or understand the really fricked up crap that we have to witness and deal with on a daily basis. There's a reason attorneys have the highest percentage of alcoholics by profession. I'm a civil litigator. I've never thought my client is a monster, but there are a few I've thought were idiots or liars or both. Two of my favorites are a client who instructed me, against my advice, to object to the temporary judge even though we had just discussed it and I had just told the freaking judge we were okay with him, and a client who testified pretty much the exact opposite of what she had told me in our initial meetings and what we had repeatedly discussed. You can't send me to the principal's office. Your substitute teacher. Civil defense here so maybe not as juicy as the crim defense folks. Some of the work I do is employment defense, particularly carnal age harassment discrimination cases. I'm pretty cynical and see a lot of cases where plaintiffs are full of crap, particularly in harassment discrimination cases. In one case I was defending a company and that company's manager, jointly. The manager seemed like a straight up guy and I pride myself in being a good judge of character. I was pretty convinced the case was just payback from a disgruntled employee. To my credit, the plaintiff, a 38 year female, was a really poor employee by all accounts. Still, it didn't prepare me from what I found doing a review of every email the company had stored on their servers. Not only did this guy stick his hand down this woman's shirt without consent, when she threatened to go to HR he said he'd get her fired and make sure she never got a job again. The lady was a single mother with three kids. He also propositioned her for fricking in exchange for a day off. He thought the email had been wiped because the company had a one year retention policy. Apparently, some of the company's older emails remained on a server before the policy was put in place because of the migration of the emails from an older outsourced IT company. Not sure if my terminology is right here. I had to substitute out of the case thereafter for conflict reasons since my two clients interests were no longer aligned. Jeez, pure luck for that woman. A former teacher told the story of an instance where he was assigned by the court to defend a woman accused of child abuse. When he saw the cigarette burns all over the kid's arms he knew she was clearly guilty but he still had to defend her. He said he's never been so relieved to hear a client found guilty. About 2 months ago one of my clients picked up a statute book off the defense table and knocked me over the head with it during a probation violation hearing. That wasn't a great day at work. Even though I've made a throwaway I'm going to be a bit vague because I still take my ethical duties to former clients seriously and can't breach privilege or the NDA I signed. This is a story from a long time ago. During the summer after my first year of law school when I was briefly working at a well-known criminal defense firm, the client whose case I was working was one of several defendants charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Three individuals had committed the murders, and several others had either helped plan it, abducted the victims, came along to watch, or filmed it. In order to see whether our client was one of the individuals present at the scene, I had to watch multiple videos of the murders. I watched multiple people brutally killed in about the worst possible way you can imagine they were chopped into pieces while they were alive and had their skulls stomped in. It wasn't some grainy security footage. It was HD video taken by bystanders just a few feet away. The video showed someone's brain squirting out of their head and another person screaming as their hands and arms were hacked off. I also had to listen to the audio to see if our client's voice could be heard. The screams were bad. The laughter was worse. It has stuck with me for years and years, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. Thankfully my internship at that firm ended a few weeks later at the end of the summer. I never looked up the sentence from the case, and have no desire to. In our case there was no presumption of innocence, 
The individuals involved had all taken pleas in hope that the prosecutors wouldn't seek the death penalty. The only thing that would change was whether our client would get the death penalty, if he was present filming, or life in prison. If we showed that he played a more minimal role, working in criminal defense meant setting my judgment for people aside so that they could be afforded the rights guaranteed to them by the constitution. I still did my job to the best of my ability, but I found myself lying awake at night for several weeks in a row, praying to every god that I knew that each of those M involved would fry in the electric chair, and that someone would laugh at their screams too. After that internship, I never returned to criminal law. I now practice civil law where I help people recover for wrongs done to them. When I saw the state's discovery file, the video of the SWAT teams entering the residence, blood on the wall, why some cut so deeply you could see all the insides, it photos of the bloody blade in the street, then reading their infant had been in her arms when it happened, yikes. Not a lawyer but my daddy's. He has told me the story of why he stopped being a criminal defense lawyer. He got a case with a couple young Russian guys who were charged with securities fraud. My dad worked super hard on the case and got the guys a great deal with some probation of finance and community service. That night the guys treated my dad to dinner and on the TV in the bar was a news story about insurance fraud and one of the guys said hey guys security fraud is old news let's try that next and pointed at the TV. That night my dad came home to my mom and said I can't do criminal defense anymore because he realized the people he was defending were truly bad people. Sometimes it takes something this small to break someone, compared to the others here, very unfortunate overall. In my hometown a guy drove to the tallest bridge in the middle of the night and threw his four kids off of it. He confessed saying it was all out of revenge to his wife. He's on death row now. Yup, I hope this hasn't happened more than once, but I helped look for four kids a guy threw off a bridge. One baby was found two states over, having floated through the Gulf of Mexico. When he told me that both of his biological teenage daughters were lying about him violating them because he refused to let them go to prom so they were mad at him. I'm a retired correction officer from NYC, Rikers Island. I once had an inmate ask me to look at his case. I had once gotten a 100% innocent guy out of jail when I had just started and I was considered one of the smarter CEOs. This guy shot another man to death at an ATM in Midtown Manhattan during a robbery attempt. It was all caught on videotape. The FBI had computer enhanced one frame from the video in which the suspect's head was in full profile. His right ear was clearly seen and had a very distinctive characteristic. It was sort of square at the top and not rounded at all. His crooked, broken nose was all I needed to say to myself he's guilty. What fricked my mind up was this pose was telling me he had every right to shoot the victim. He looked at himself as a professional robber. If you resisted then he felt justified to frick you up. In this case he shot and killed the ATM customer because he tried to fight back. I couldn't believe how this guy was behaving. Smiling when he told me he was a professional. I went and got a book called Inside the Criminal Mind. It helped answer some questions I had about my new line of work. I have since retired from the NYC DOC and I'm so happy to put all that negative crap behind me. Pose got 25 years to life. This one isn't as horrific as the murders and CP stories on here but, as a law intern, I had to prepare a defense for a huge govt corporation who had denied employment to a man who applied on compassionate grounds. It's a govt policy where if an employee dies during their term then their nearest relative, parent spouse child, is entitled to get employment in the same company. This man's father had passed away aged 60 after working there all his life and the corporation was rejecting it on a mere technical issue that there was a spelling error in some of his documents. In a way, this is actually much more terrifying. The people who curb stomp other people while filming and laughing are horrible, but they are extreme corner cases. The corporation denying people benefits on a technicality is something I could see happening routinely. I sat in on a criminal trial without knowing what was going on. Turned out it involved an uncle physically shaming and riding his niece back doors. I only realized this when, less than 5 minutes after I walked in, the government put its expert on the stand and went through blown up pictures of the 5 year old girl's shit shoot and fanny to show signs of trauma. Yup. Former juvenile court attorney and was listening to this case. 
I was not involved so no RPC issue. Two miners, both male, had decided to rob a pizza delivery guy, so they called for a delivery pizza to an empty apartment building. The delivery guy arrived and was subsequently robbed, something like a large pie his phone and a 2 liter. The miners then decide they want to take the delivery guy's car, so they take his keys, while one is trying to start the car. The other decides to physically shame and assault the delivery guy. Turns out the delivery guy's car was a manual stick shift and the miners have no idea how to drive it. Instead of ending their crime spree, they then kidnap the driver and force him to drive them to their other friend's house across town. Once they're the same miner from earlier physically shame and assault the pizza delivery driver again, then they beat up the delivery driver and run off. Driver makes it into a local shop down the road where he calls police. Adult offenders don't really bother me, but minors, their brains are not fully developed enough to understand the weight of their actions. Kids can be monsters. During a mediation conference my client bragged about continuing to physically discipline her pregnant teenage daughter justifying it because her face ain't pregnant. I have learned a lot from this thread, mainly, that I should probably go into digital and copyright law. That seems pretty safe. I can usually figure it out from the pre-trial discovery, and in particular the police investigation. Often it is the seized phone or computer that seals the deal. For example emails showing he repeatedly attempted to prostitute his two-year-old to men on the internet did it in one case. Not for a defendant, but as a prosecutor at the state attorney's office in Miami. There was this 15-year-old Haitian kid when I was working in the juvenile division that still haunts me. I remember his face even now because he had two distinct tattoos on it, with very bloodshot eyes. He was arrested after he ran into police chasing after a teenage girl with a Gatorade bottle. It turns out the girl worked at a gas station and had called the police a week earlier because the boy was sitting outside staring at her. He had came back a week later, walked into the store and stole a Gatorade in front of her without a word, dumped it outside, pushed a patron away and poured gasoline in the bottle, then starting walking back towards the attendant. She freaks out and starts running out the store. He comes in, gets a lighter and starts chasing after her. He runs right into two patrol officers and gets arrested. Just looking at him in court freaked me out, which was unusual to say the least. He seemed completely dead inside, showed absolutely zero emotions and didn't say a single word at any stage, even after sentencing. Five years later, I was watching the first 48 and saw the Haitian kid's mugshot at the end, with the same tattoos, arrested for home invasion and triple murder without motive in Miami. I am a lawyer for people on death row. Although some of my clients have been convicted of horrible, sometimes nightmare inducing, crimes, I honestly have never had the thought oh, this person is a monster, what I am far more likely to think is colon 1. How do I convince my child to never try M because M psychosis is freaking real and horrifying? Or 2. I am so lucky to have been born into a family where my parents weren't violent drug addicted mentally ill all of the above. Or 3. Jesus Christ how differently things may have turned out if my client had had access to mental health services on the outside. Or 4. Wow, this person who was completely dysfunctional on the outside has adapted really, really well to the structure that her institutional environment provides. Perhaps it's due to my own religious beliefs and to my analytical nature, but the idea that some people are just bad or monsters has never rung true to me nor has it been borne out by my observed experience. Not me but my uncle. His client was a diddler and when my uncle asked him why he did it, the guy said man, she was asking for it. The victim was an 8 year old girl. Have mostly avoided criminal defense but not family law. Worst was the surgeon with narcissistic personality disorder and a drinking problem. A distant second was the near octogenarian who was getting older ladies hooked on M and getting them to help him move it's in his old pickup truck. He gave me the creeps. A judge friend of mine once told me, remember, the enemy is the client. Best piece of advice I've gotten in these 20 years. 
Not an attorney, but a story from an attorney. I had a family member who committed murder. A pretty terrible double murder in the presence of a child. I had to testify against the family member which meant I had to spend a lot of time with the defense also. The attorney knew the family member was guilty but god he was going to mount the best defense possible and he did. Years later I ran into that attorney and he told me the very first time I sat down with X. He looked me right in the eye and told me things I can't tell you. But I have been a PD for over 20 years and X scared me worse in the first 5 minutes of our meeting than any other client ever had before or since. I know that X told the lawyer that he should have taken out the little B kid that witnessed. And he told him how he should have done it and for the sake of everyone I won't share that. But yeah. In 5 minutes he knew X was a monster and he still gave him one heck of a defense. Hated him for it. But respected him doing his job. The lawyer did however not represent X in any of his appeals. Lawyers. Why did that one couple call off the divorce? My parents told my sister and I that they were getting a divorce. Dad found out about his cancer before they went through with it. My mom stuck with him and took care of him through his passing. My Phil remarried his first wife so she could have health benefits through her terminal cancer. My aunt and uncle recently decided not to get divorced. He's legitimately crazy and on his fourth wife. She doesn't speak any English and is with him for his pension. This divorce started because he ran up a large amount of credit card debt buying worthless art at auction. He wanted to mortgage their shared house to pay it off, but she wouldn't sign for that, because it would just make a bad situation worse. Thus he wanted to divorce her for not signing and she wanted to divorce him to secure her half of the money from his antics. They recently decided to call it off, though. My uncle's logic for calling it off was that he doesn't want to pay the lawyer's fees. He doesn't really care about losing half his money, but he's not willing to give a cent to the lawyer. My aunt's reason was that she realized she's 13 years younger than him, and that she could just outlive him and get all the money. So, they remain unhappily married. Whoa, that's fantastically and impressively ugly. Neither party recognizing that we've only got so many days on this planet and both being willing to waste time being petty. I do a lot of divorces in my practice, and typically the ones that get called off are the younger couples that decide they did not make a good enough effort to save the marriage. Half the time, I'll see the client again in about 6 months. The other half seems to work out. The only case that stands out in my memory is a case that was nearing the end. Both attorneys had put in a lot of work. Mediation had been semi-successful, and we were fairly confident we were going to be able to settle the divorce without a full-blown trial. But we knew that a couple issues might have to be decided by the judge. It was clear that the divorce was going to happen though. One day, I get a call from my client. He told me he didn't want the divorce anymore, and he gave me his reason why. I informed him that we couldn't stop the divorce from happening if his wife wanted to press forward. He told me his wife wanted to call off the divorce as well for the same reason, which I'll get to in a moment. I called OC, and he informed me that his client wanted to call off the divorce as well. For the same reason, apparently, both parties had been visited by God on the same night and he demanded that they honor their vows and make the marriage work. Keep in mind both parties have spent a lot of time and money already. I asked to see what his thoughts were, and he said who are we to argue with god we had a good laugh, and they are still married to this day. So my deep voice through the window worked. When I was a kid the neighbor's dad ran off, went to get six and never came back. He was a rich banker type and his wife was a harried stay at home mom with three boys about my age. About 10 years later and she's a real estate agent making decent money. She lost weight, dresses nice, etc. Basically the milf next door. She has a fiancé but is technically still married so starts the legal proceedings. Guy comes back to appear in court, sign papers, etc. And falls head over heels in love again with his estranged wife. She takes him back and dumps the fiancé, my friends, the three boys down the street. Hated their dad for leaving and couldn't believe their mom took him back. IDK how she can forgive him for ditching his entire family for years. Love is love but he fricked over his own kids. Divorce lawyer here. Seen a few reconciliations over the years. Couple of cases I've seen. Husband completed rehab and was fully committed to sobriety. Separation where one party was living in a Marriott suite for a month. 
not securing own residence, just too hard on the family going through just that transition, much less an entire divorce. Two parents realizing that they couldn't put the kids through the process of a divorce at that time. Two elder parties who just realized it made no financial sense to be divorced, taxes, health insurance, etc. One thing to definitely make clear is that lawyers, for the most part, are actually happy to see two people not get divorced, especially if there are kids involved. Yes, we don't get paid as much, but there's always someone getting divorced. As a divorce lawyer you accept that you traffic in human misery and sometimes it's just nice to see people staying together. Reconciliations, when it's for the best, and adoptions, those are the best parts of the job. Not a lawyer but I worked as an assistant in a family law courtroom, down to the last two cases for the judge to hear for the day and they could not have been more different. The first one was a 10 plus year divorce where the two parties could not stand the sight of one another. Over the course of their case, the parties were belligerent to one another, the other party's legal counsel, and even towards the children if it seemed that they were on the wrong side. Throughout their many appearances in court, I honestly wondered what they were going to do with all the free time of not being in litigation when this was all over. Second couple was much younger, they did not have lawyers, and it was their first appearance for their divorce. During the first case's proceedings, the second couple stepped outside. At first I thought it was for the other couple's privacy, and didn't come in until the very end of the first couple's hearing. When they were called in, they just walked in and said they didn't want to pursue the divorce until they gave their marriage a better shot. They realized things could be much much worse and seeing a disastrous divorce put things into perspective. I did not see the second couple again while I worked at the courthouse but eventually saw them at the local supermarket a month or so later with their kids so I guess it's working out so far. Almost makes you wonder if setting up sham horrible divorce proceedings is a precursor to any divorce hearing might be worth the effort. My parents called off their divorce. My mom didn't make enough money to take care of the kids alone. She would have had to move us all back to our home country where she would have had family help. My dad didn't want to lose me so they stayed together. In the end they divorced 10 years later. Not a lawyer but an assistant to a family law attorney. Had a call yesterday from a woman looking for a divorce, but was unsure how to go about it. Her husband has traumatic brain injury and therefore can't sign any legal papers himself. The reason she wants the divorce though is so that she can be paid for taking care of her husband. Apparently she can't be paid as in home care while they're married so she decided to jump on the divorce train. Nothing wrong with that. I was live-in carer for my father and legal guardian for my siblings and I had a wicked hard time with working, having visiting nurses, the expenses, 7 years of that had became nursing home, bankruptcy, and counseling realizing I had no social life or support network because my existence was solely caring for two people. I hope it works out for her. My parents called off theirs twice, they separated and lived apart for about 6 months each time. They hid the fig thing well as it blindsided us kids each time and it crushed my dad. Only time I've ever seen him cry was mom telling us he was moving out. In the end, each time, he just caved on his position regarding the issue because he couldn't stand not seeing us each day. My sister was the result of their last reconciliation and the last 20 years has been the longest stint without an attempted divorce. Not a lawyer. My parents called off their divorce 3-5 times over the span of 10 years. I wanted them to split up because it was obvious they aren't meant for each other. My mom's reason for not going through with it was a typical stay together for the kids scenario. Although her and I had a rough relationship during my teenage years and one of the times she told me the divorce was my fault. My dad's reasoning, as we found out later, was a lot more messed up. Each time he asked for a divorce it was because he was cheating and tried to leave my mom for the other woman. But every time the woman would reject him and he would go back to my mom. It was a different woman each time. They did finally divorce when I was 17 and it was messy and traumatic for everyone involved. But things are significantly better now that they are not together. When my brother and I were 15 and 17 we confronted my parents and said if you're staying together for us. Please stop doing that, you're making us all miserable. A few days later, they said they were getting divorced, and after a customary separation period, they did. Not a lawyer but my parents called off their divorce. 
I'm pretty sure they weren't all that serious about the divorce in the first place, but my dad left in the middle of the night after an argument. We were having money problems so they fought a lot but I don't think either of them ever left the house until this point. He stupidly went to stay with his much younger, attractive student, both adults. My dad had taught her for years at TAFE, she and many other students of his have close relationships with my parents. My mum took this as a personal assault and confirmation that he was cheating so started the divorce process. My dad got an apartment. They both struggled even more apart. My brother had a school performance and they both came. Reconnected. He moved back in that week and got out of his lease. They dropped the divorce. I was pretty young so there was probably a lot that went on that I didn't see. But it seemed to me very hasty and not thought through tbh. Not a lawyer, but my parents called off their divorce. This divorce was absolutely violent, chaotic, and tumultuous. I was 8 or 9 when it happened, and at least once a week there would be an absolutely horrendous fighting match. Their mutual hatred for each other, and for me and my sister, was only interspersed with my mother's seizures, as she has a brain tumor. Around this time, she had almost choked herself to death twice, with my dad saving her life. This is when she had the removal surgery. Things got worse and worse, though, and I was especially the source of blame. I have mild autism, and this was much more pronounced as a child. My mother had essentially spoiled me out of her concern for me, while my dad is more of the tough love type. This caused contentions, and I had heard very often how I had destroyed the family. I was left a lonely and confused child caught in the middle of endless screaming matches, borderline physical violence, and I was the center of blame for it all. Then there was a court hearing. Almost Christmas. I was 11. I was enjoying a stay with my grandparents when it happened. I had to wait for what seemed like hours, and I was never informed on what happened. All of a sudden, I have to go to my other grandparents indefinitely. My dad had one custody. I didn't get to see my mom that Christmas. It broke my heart. Then, I spent weekends with my dad in the mountains. I never liked him, I still don't. He's quick to anger. It caused endless screaming matches between me and him. Because he had blamed me and my mother for wrecking the family. He's never wrong. Even when he is. At this point I had been emotionally stunted enough from my ASD. But this discord had made it worse. Eventually, this goes on and on for a year or so. Apparently, my parents come to the realization that this divorce thing isn't working. My parents, despite making a lot of money individually, had realized that they had made a downward spiral that never needed to happen. My mom needs my dad to help her navigate things with her health and finances. And my dad needs her out of love. Eight years later, and things have been unstable for the whole time. I honestly think the divorce should have happened. There is no way that this could ever have worked out well from the start. This sounds like a freaking nightmare from start to finish. Not a lawyer, but this one hits close to home. Currently divorcing my bipolar wife of 13 years, because she's in a 14 month long manic psychotic episode where she compulsively cheats with a man. That's the TL doctor, it's insanely complex, I can't stand it, and it's probably the only option, to let her completely crash and burn in her fantasy, so she may start to heal, but sometimes, for a few days, the mania recedes, and she's back, and she realizes what she's done, and she's scared, of herself, of the disease, of her future, and I know she loves me, and I feel like crap. Because it's like I'm putting down a sick puppy. I'm the sole earner. Because she never could hold to her job due to her BP. She's going to be fricked. Really fricked. And I really want to stop everything. But I know that her anxiety will creep back. And she'll have another panic attack and rush to him again. I would stop everything in a heartbeat if we could get that crap under control. But I feel we tried everything. Frick that disease. Obligatory anal. My wife and I were talking to lawyers about divorce because we were not working out. Over focus on career, financial struggles, a possible affair, expectations not being met, etc. After a consultation we decided to go to a counselor. We came together because we agreed that the counselor was a complete butthole. That was 33 years ago. Still married, 3 now adult children, love each other madly. OMG I read that as obligatory anal. I thought that's what made the couple call off the divorce. 
not a lawyer. My brother-in-law's parents were getting a divorce but then decided to wait until the last kid was an independent adult before getting divorced. But they didn't let the kids know until the youngest was 16. I don't think they hated each other but they were seeing other people after the kids knew. They let the kids know that they were basically roommates for the time being and that it was okay. They made sure that the kids didn't have to live two lives or pick sides. Whatever the reason was for not being together as a couple, they kept to themselves. We still don't know the reason. All I know is that none of the kids feel like it was anyone's fault, had happy lives, and love both the parents. Both parties are happy not being together and the divorce was very clean. Ian Friend's wife filed for divorce because a female friend of hers told her she was screwing her husband and felt really guilty. My friend denied it all the way. Day of court it came out that the wife's friend was lying. Dates that she claimed they were screwing he was out of town on business, or had proof he was doing something. Great example was he was buying car parts when she said he was screwing her. CC receipts proved it. Wife finally realizes her friend was lying to her and calls off the divorce. Much hugging and sobbing in court. They went away together for a bit, and the wife dumped her fried. Turns out her fried was a nutcase who wanted her husband. People are insane. Yeah you ruined my marriage so I guess I'll just be with you now. I did family law for a while and one client that stuck out was this chill rasta guy whose wife was divorcing him because of his many affairs. Now, this couple were in their 70s at the time so I thought it was a bit weird that she waited so long. When we got to court we had to wait a few hours for the hearing. My client and his, soon to be, ex-wife spent the whole time cuddling and joking with each other. They were obviously still very much in love. After the hearing I talked to him about it and he told me that they weren't really divorcing over the affairs. Both of them had had lots of affairs throughout the marriage and they were in a quasi open relationship. No, the reason they were divorcing was that he had gotten busted for possession too many times and because of this he had managed to rack up a bunch of debts and pending criminal matters. They had decided that if they got divorced she wouldn't have to worry about his debts and he figured he could delay the criminal proceedings by reason of family hardship. Possibly until he died. I don't think their plan holds water but it was what they wanted to do so we helped them through a very amicable divorce. Mother-in-law died. This was a mixture of her being way too controlling of her son. And when she passed away, the wife just spent most of the time consoling her husband. Not a lawyer, but my parents called off their divorce after my half-sister admitted she lied about what my dad did. That was about 14 years ago and my parents are happier than ever. I went to high school with a girl let's call her Abby, whose mum and stepdad had married and divorced at least 4 times. They were just getting back together for their next marriage as me and Abby drifted apart. They'd been approached by numerous magazines and talk shows about it. It still baffles me why they didn't just keep it to a relationship rather than getting divorced remarried each time, making a huge deal about it so expensive not the lawyer they didn't call off the woman asked for increasingly outrageous things and the guy agreed with everything there was an agreement and he killed her in the same night and then himself freaking yikes my grandma's parents divorced when she was four her mom took her to denmark to live with her grandparents and her my grandma grew up came back to the u.s she was still a citizen and started a family of her own her dad apparently got remarried and had four more kids. When the first three of my grandma's kids were in high school, her mom came back over to live with her, and my grandpa, and help with the kids. Eventually, after nearly 40 years, my great grandpa was so disillusioned with his new family, he left them all kids grown, and remarried my great grandma. They lived together happily to their mid 90s and died 8 months apart. My great grandma was still kicking. But the doctors said she was so sad after he died, she just let herself go. She basically died of a broken heart. This doesn't quite answer the question, but man is it a weird one. P.S. My most of grandma's half siblings hate her for no reason we can figure out. I think the reason is obvious. Remember an obvious answer doesn't have to be logical. Now either, but my husband and I filed for divorce around year 7. 7 year itch. 
but after decided to try counseling. It actually really helped and so life went on. About a year later the divorce attorney we jointly filed with called to ask if we wanted to come in to finalize the paperwork and finish the process. We had completely forgotten about the paperwork and such and yes the lawyer was both happy and surprised that we decided against the divorce. Took a little while to get the automatic child support situation straightened out with the state though. Well, there was this one couple that was 100% set on a divorce. They were arguing about who would get what and what would happen to their kid and the dog. They decided that the kid would move from house to house every year, because the dad was moving far away. Then they look at the dog. They both love the dog more than anything. The one problem was the dog couldn't go in planes. The dog brought them both back together and from what I heard they didn't argue again. Typical. Who cares about the kid? But love for the dog beings them back together haha. -ha. Weirdest one I ever saw was the wife used filing for divorce to leverage the husband into agreeing to let her start a photography business. Husband got served. He relented. She started her photography business. No more divorce. What a healthy relationship. They never got to the point of lawyers. But when I was 8 my mom, myself and two older brothers went on a cross country road trip to Michigan for a family reunion. I didn't find out until my 20s that during that trip, my dad was supposed to move out of the house and they'd be done with each other. He even had an apartment with two roommates lined up. I didn't even have a clue they were fighting. When we got home, he was still there. He greeted us smiling and us kids didn't know any different. I don't remember anything after that, but my mom said that she kind of broke down with hopelessness. She just left the house and walked 3 miles to her friend's house and cried there for hours. She said it's because she had her life going forward planned out, and was ready to move on. But I guess he decided for them both to remain together. I didn't ask for more details, that had been hard enough to hear. Although, since we are on the same page about how much of a selfish tool my dad is, I asked her why they didn't just get divorced and her justification was that he supports us financially. Her mom never got help from her dad after their divorce so my mom honestly thought she'd be sole as well. I didn't really understand because it was the 90s and surely he would have paid child support. I suppose I was kind of salty that she chose to stay with my dad. Someone who never could accept me and made us feel miserable all the time. So I told her I would have rather grown up poor than live with him. At least we would have been free from his dark cloud. It sounds like she just wanted what was best for you and made a bad judgment call. I hope you're both doing okay. Not a lawyer. Was helping a friend of a friend move out as he was leaving his bad crap crazy gf. We're loading furniture and appliances onto a flatbed truck and get to one of those big screen TVs. This was the 90s, when they were actually big boxes. We stopped to try and figure out the best way to move and strap this thing down on the truck. The idiot goes to call the company that made it, for their advice. While he's up there, GF's father stops by and convinces him to stay together. He even throws in the down payment for a house. While unloading the truck, the rest of us could not hold back our laughter. They got married, and divorced about 2 years later. TLDR a big screen TV. I've been doing divorces for a long time. I've had a few clients call off their divorces. Some because they legit had a change of heart. Some cancel because they realize they can't live with seeing their kid only every other weekend. But there's also a few that cancel because they feel it's better to stay in something they know, regardless of how bad at it is. I guess they feel the status quo is miserable but at least it's predictable. I have had a few clients ghost me. They stopped answering my calls, won't respond to any communication. Eventually, I found they got back together. Honestly, it's pretty rare for people to call off the divorce. Even when they do, they still eventually go through with it. Sad but true, at least in my experience. Not a lawyer but my cousin just decided to back out of getting divorced. She has raised her husband's two boys for 10 years since they were 3 and 5, officially adopted them and all that. They have a daughter together as well. When custody came up a lawyer told her that she will not even get visitation with the boys. 10 years raising them and making them a part of our side of the family. 10 years of substance abuse problems from their dad and the other stuff that goes with his untreated PTSD but the lawyer says she would never be in their lives again. That's fricked up man. 
you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.